Hello everyone. First of all, my name is Edgar Buchanan. I'm a research associate working here in the University of York, of York. And my research is about evolutionary robotics, but my PhD was in swarm robotics. I'll be teaching some of the lectures. There are five in total that I will be teaching this year. And the first of the lectures is about hardware in swarm robotics. Before I start talking about any details, I would like to mention why hardware is important in swarm robotics. Probably you have heard about the concept swarm intelligence. Swarm intelligence is where it all began. It was about evolving agents in simulations that are decentralized to do a specific task. But later on, some people decided to put this concept into real, into the physical world. And to achieve that, they had to create some robots and they had to do some hardware. So this is the main goal about it. We want to translate the principles of swarm intelligence into hardware. And that's why hardware is important. Otherwise, there will be no swarm robotics. Robots, hardware, and tracking systems. This lecture is going to be divided into three parts. The first part, I'm going to talk about what are we looking for in robot hardware? What kind of specifications in specific? Then, we are going to talk about some examples of robot platforms that are used in many research groups across the world. And the third part is about tracking systems. Probably you have seen them, probably you not, but they're really useful if you want to run experiments with real robots and collect some data. Let's start with the first one, Swarm Robotics Hardware. Right, what do I mean by this? What kind of things we want from what are we looking for in our robots? First, what are the properties? And what are the requirements in terms of hardware? For this, we first need to define our task. Once we have our task, we can decide what kind of components we need, what kind of sensors, actuators. And then we can start developing our robot hardware. But most likely, we can start with something very basic. We can start with a robot with two wheels that is going to make the robot move. We can have some sensors, such as infrared sensors, so the robot can avoid obstacles. And we can even provide it a camera so it can detect any other objects that we want. But let's try to define some properties, basic properties that all robots have in some robotics. They are mainly low cost. As you probably are aware, some robotics is about having big numbers of robots operating at the same time. But if each robot was expensive, this could get really, really expensive fast. So it's important to keep each robot low cost so we can afford a lot of them. Low complexity. Again, one of the properties of some robotics is about emergent behaviors from simple interactions of, between the robots. And this means that we don't need any sophisticated hardware to achieve this. We, with simple actions, the robots should carry complex tasks through emergent behaviors. The third one, and, and important one, is that the robots should be capable to interact with each other and their surroundings. Otherwise, there will be no cooperation. For example, I just said that the robots need camera, for example, to see each other. Or what about sending signals to each other? This is important, so the robots can cooperate and can achieve the task 
working together. Okay, what are the specifications? Again, we just started to talk about it. We need the road to move. We need locomotion. We can have some kind of limbs to make it move. We can have wheels, but it's better to use wheels for simplifications because limbs are harder to control. We need sensing. The most common sensor used in research are the infrared sensors. And of course, we need a controller. We need a microcontroller where to store all the information or where the processing is going to take place. And finally, if we want the robots to communicate with each other, we need some kind of mechanism to communicate with each other. Or not necessarily for the robots to communicate with each other. We can use this communication interface also to retrieve information from the robots and then we can analyze this data. Some of the robots that we have here in the university, they use Bluetooth and we connect this Bluetooth to the main server and we retrieve all the information that we want. Right. Here, I would like to very, very briefly discuss an important topic in robotics and in research and it's about the importance and challenges of robot start standardization. What do I mean by robot standardization? Well, it's just across the world there are multiple research groups working with robots and each research group is developing a new technology. But let's assume that I develop a new technology and I want to compare it with other, other technology that other people have developed. Well, we are going to need the same platform to compare both experiments fairly. And there are two options to have to achieve this. Either we get it, we buy the robot or we make the robot ourselves. The problems of the second approach is that it's going to take time to design and make this robot. And we don't want to spend time doing this. We want to spend time testing our technology and improving it. And the problem with the first approach is that if the platform is too expensive, then probably we cannot afford it. All right, again, why is it important? Like I was saying before, it helps us to replicate the experiments that other people in other research and other researchers have done in our lab. This is really important. If you want to publish your results in, <coughs> pardon me, in journals, then most journals <clears throat> are going to ask for you to have experiments with real robots. Not many journals accept simulations anymore. So it's important that if you want to test your experiments, you have real robots and physical robots. And again, we want to reduce the time and money that we invest in designing robots and invest this time developing the technologies. The big challenge of fraud standardization. If the research that you are carrying on has a very small group of people working on it, it's going to be really hard to find a robot platform that works with you. And once you find it, the price of that robot platform is going to be high. On the other hand, if the research that you are doing is very popular and many people are doing it, then probably you're going to find a robot platform for a lower price. So yeah, it's important to consider this price when we are doing research. The second one 
is about outdated robots. Let's say that you bought a group of robots five years ago. Well, now five years passed and the technology has changed. Therefore, those robots that you bought, probably they are outdated. The power, the computational power is not going to be enough anymore. And you're going to need to improve this somehow. I will come back back to this later on, but there are ways to achieve this. And also, the, another challenge is that there are different needs. And what do I mean by this? For example, if my research requires a specific specification for my robots that not other people have done, then most likely I will have to build the robots by myself. So, but if my task is common in research, probably I'm going to find a robot that works well with these kind of environments. So yeah, for, if I had to mention an, an example, is in my research that I'm carrying on right now. Right now I'm doing evolutionary robotics. All the robots that I'm evolving right now, they are different from each other. They have wheels and sensors in different places, the shape is different, and it's not gonna be possible for me to buy all the robots that I'm evolving, and I'm gonna have to build these robots. But luckily, in my project, we're also making a machine that is gonna build these robots. I might talk about this later on. But, well, let's see some examples of robots in literature and in other research groups, and some good and other not so good examples. The first one is APOC. I'm not gonna give any details about it because I'm gonna mention this robot again later on in this lecture. But the APOC is a widely used robot in some robotics. Why? Because it meets all the requirements that we were discussing before. The, low, the specifications is a relatively simple robot, it can move, it has infrared sensors, it has a microcontroller. But again, this robot is very expensive, and the reason is because not many research groups use this robot. The Now robot. This robot is really popular. You will see it in many universities, in many research groups, and it is widely used in research as well, mainly in research about human interaction. And this is a good example how a robot become, became standardized and it's widely used by research. How this robot became so popular, you might, might be wondering. Well, it's because of it has many applications, not only in research. For example, they use it for teaching as well. And there are some people that even use it as a kind of a toy. Right? But what in the future? What about all the robots that are going to become popular? I got a feeling that the next robot, that dog, robot from Boston Dynamic is going to become really popular because it's a very advanced robot and not available. Not everyone can buy it. And everyone can develop technology for this robot. Anyone can develop better ways to create controllers for this robot. This robot is going to be popular and it's going to be in many research groups and it's going to become part of the standardization in research. Right. We have discussed about specifications and features that we want in our robots. We, start, we talked about robot standardization. What I'm going to do next is to show you some examples about robots that are already used in 
research and for some robotics in specific. So, robot hardware. Let's start with the popular ones. The Capera robot. This was introduced more than 20 years ago and it was widely used. Over a thousand research groups used it. Let's have a look at another one. Oh, pardon. Let's see a video of this robot. This is an interesting experiment of the robot where you're gonna see they're gonna throw an obstacle and all the robots are gonna avoid this obstacle. Probably they're having a tracking system and they track the position of the wall at all, at all given times and they can tell the robots where to move next. But this is a very nice implementation of these roads, a nice use. Right. Next robot, Epoch. We, we just started to talk about it. And it was introduced more than 10 years ago. It was 2009, it's widely used. And after nine years, the second version was available. And this is very interesting because for nine years, there were no updates with this robot. So if you wanted to run a complex program in this robot, you couldn't do it in 2017 because the microcontroller was outdated. This is when people started to develop expansions. And I'm gonna again come back to this later on. This robot has infrared sensors, it has two wheels, and the two wheels are controlled by stepper motors. And the video that I'm showing right now is an application of this robot. This video was recorded in the University of York. And what the robots are doing is they are assembling together to create a structure. Each robot has a hat on it. And in the hat, there are some magnets. So when one hat is close to another hat, they connect to each other. And the main application of this is was how to create structures using a group of robots. And the way that how it works is that one robot recruits the others and tells where to put that robot next. In this part of the video, you can uh, appreciate how after the robots cre have created the structure, they can move together towards a single target or doing the same motion. And this approach is very scalable. You can increase the number of the robots and you're going to have the same behavior. Cool. Let's move on. Kilobot. This is another really popular robot. It was introduced in 2012. And a good thing about the kilobots is that they can be all programmed at once. A problem with, with the epoch is that 
every time you wanted to load a program to the epoch, you had to connect that robot to the PC and load the program. And you might be thinking, oh, that's easy to do, right? Well, imagine that you're using 10 robots. Then you have to do that task 10 times. And let's assume that task 10 takes one minute each. That's going to be 10 minutes in total, assuming that you're using 10 robots. If you're using more robots, it's going to take longer. And this is not a problem with a kilobot, because they use infrared light to program the robot. So they emit the same infrared light to all the robots, and all the robots receive that light, and all the robots receive the same program at the same time. The problem with this robot is that every time that you want to run a new experiment, it needs to be calibrated. And why it needs to be calibrated? It's because about the locomotion of this robot. The, the way that this robot moves, it's, it's by vibrating. And vibrating is not a very accurate way to move. So when you turn on a new robot, you need to make sure that the, the vibration produces the movement that you want. And as I was saying, it vibrates to move. It doesn't have any sensors, up, and it only has the receivers. Let's see a video of the robots doing a task. In this case, they are self-assembly, creating new structures similar to the previous video. In this part, they are showing how the algorithm works. And basically, each you start with a robot that is going to be called a seed. And the robots, all the robots are going to move around the edge of the shape. And they are going to stop once they reach the position of the structure. And all the robots are going to keep doing the same thing until we have the structure that we want. Right, let's keep move on. The football robot. This robot is more complex compared to the previous robots. Why? The wheels are different. It uses like a warm wheels. It has LEDs all around it. It has a gripper so it can attach all the robots. It has an omnidirectional camera so it can see all around itself. And it has some infrared sensors, but they are dedicated for communication. So the robots can communicate with other robots easily. It was introduced in 2011. But an interesting thing about this robot is that it's not for sale. It was developed in a research group in Brussels. So if you wanted to do similar experiments that the people in Brussels did, it was going to be hard to do it because you could not buy this road platform anywhere. 
you had to develop your own robot platform to recreate the similar experiments that they did. And again, this is a common pattern in research where people develop their own robots, but they don't sell them. So it's hard to replicate their experiment. And this is a really nice video of the application of these robots. Swarmanoid is a heterogeneous robotic swarm made up of three types of robots. The handbot is designed to manipulate objects. The handbot can also climb, but needs help from other robots to move around. The footbot is a wheeled robot with a gripper. Using its gripper, a footbot can form physical connections with other footbots or with the handbot. The iBot can fly and rapidly explore large areas. It can attach to the ceiling and provide environmental information to the other robots. In this film, the swarmanoid is deployed to find and then retrieve a book. Here, the swarmanoid has already partially explored its environment. As the iBots search, successive iBots attach to the ceiling, forming a connected network. Once an iBot has found the book, the knowledge propagates back to the deployment area. The handbot then requests transport assistance from the footbot. Using the iBot network, the footbots form a ground-based chain linking the deployment area to the book. The second handbot prepares for transport. The first footbot handbot entity has rotated and aligned with the bookshelf. While climbing, the handbot supports its weight with a cord attached to the ceiling. Actuated fans give the handbot control over its angle of rotation around the vertical axis. Formino is a parallel distributed system. Parallel activity and redundancy increase its robustness and flexibility. The second footbot handbot could retrieve another book or act as a backup should the first footbot handbot fail. In this film, the swarmanoid retrieves a single book. However, the true value of the swarmanoid concept 
would manifest itself in parallel task execution scenarios and in unstructured environments. Future incarnations of the swarmanoid might be able to replace human workers in hazardous environments, perform search and rescue missions, or even conduct exoplanetary exploration. Right. Here in the University of York, we have also developed our own robots. And the first of those robots is the Pyserm. And it was the first prototype. This basically was using a Polulu 3 Pi robot as a base. And we design a PCB that sits on top of it. So we could have a microcontroller, in this case an embed microcontroller, to control the robot. This robot has a IR sensors. And this robot uh, was a very simple one, but it was used in creative activities. For example, there was a design agency who used these robots and they put these robots on a table. And when the room got really crowded, these robots started to move all the way. And when the room started to get more quiet, these robots started to move more softly. This was just to, for the agency to study what happened when people were around these robots. How did people react to them? So yeah, this was an interesting platform that it was not only used in research, it was used as well outside of the university. The next platform is the Sysom robot. This is the second prototype, the second iteration of this robot. Everything was made here in the university. The PCB was made. Uh, the body was 3D printed and it has similar features as the first prototype. It has uh, infrared sensors, two wheels, Bluetooth for communication, embed for controller. But this was a more stable version of the robot and it was even sold to other universities such as the Metropolitan Manchester University and Edinburgh's Napier University. This is the robot platform that I personally used for my research when I was doing my PhD here in York. Right, the third iteration of the robots, the Exaberry. This robot the body is made of laser cut and it has a Raspberry Pi controller. This is a more complex robot. In the previous iterations, the microcontrol it was only a microcontroller. Now we have a full computer in this robot, so we can make more complicated tasks. We can have learning, we can run simulations inside of the robot, we can have more complicated things. Another interesting feature about this robot is that it has some sensor modules. Each of these modules has multiple sensors. From time of light sensors to color sensors, infrared sensors, and even some LEDs. So yeah, this robot platform was more multipurpose robot. Some honorable mentions that I like to mention. The first one is the Simbrian project. This was an Euro European project and it was about having multiple robots that could self repair and self recover. And they could create structures as well, similar to the ones that I have shown with the Epoch. 
So for example, here we are looking at different modules connecting to each other to create a more complex robot. But you might wonder, well, what's the purpose of this robot? Well, if the robots self-assemble, they could reach other areas that previously they couldn't, or they could perform other tasks. And there were different types of robots. This was a, an heterogeneous swarm. Just to remind you about these heterogeneous and homogeneous swarms. Homogeneous swarm is a swarm where all the robots are the same. An heterogeneous swarm is where not all the robots are the same. You can have different types. For example, here we have two types of robots with different purposes. The scout robot that probably was used to explore and the other robot that it was used to rise the robot to reach areas that previously it was not possible. It's called the active wheel. All right then, the second one is the Cocoro project. And this is a underwater swarm. And the history behind these robots is quite interesting. The robot that you are seeing right now in video, half of it was assembled from a toy, which is a yellow part, and half of it was developed by a, a research group. So basically what how this robot worked is that you put all the robots underwater and these robots, the, the way that they communicated with each other was by flashing lights as you are seeing in the video. This, this is a really useful not for the robots to communicate with each other but also to detect whether a robot is faulty or not. For example, if one of your neighbors stops flashing lights, 
it means that probably something went wrong. One of the applications of these robots, or the main objective of these robots, was to explore around the undersea. And instead of sending one robot to explore, we could send multiple. In this way, if one robot fails, it wouldn't be a big problem because we have other robots. And also, the probability of the robots getting lost is lower because the robots will create chains that connect with between the base and the last robot. Anyway, a very brief talk about extension boards, a cheap way to upgrade robots. Probably you remember early in this talk, I met, I talk about the Epoch robot that it was introduced in 2008, and there was no upgrades for nine years. So how did people cope with that? What if they wanted to run something more complicated. Well, they developed their own extension boards that they could connect with their robots. The first one is the Arduino extension board. Again, this is an Arduino board that you sit on the Epoch robot, and if you wanted to do something more power hungry, you will do it in the Arduino, and then you will send a simple commands to the to the Epoch robot, for example, turn this wheel this direction, turn this wheel to the other direction. It, the Epoch would be the interface, basically. There are other approaches, like the Linux extension board, and this one was developed here in York. It's a pipe extension board, quite similar to the Linux one in Arduino. But in this case, they are using a Pi 0W that you connect directly to the Epoch. And now you have a super uh, computer on this robot and you can run more complicated programs. And this Arduino, sorry, this Raspberry Pi had Wi-Fi, so you could connect to all the robots at once. These were some approaches to handle the robots that they were falling behind. All right. Tracking systems. Why tracking systems are important? First, 
let's define what a tracking system is. A tracking system is a camera or a group of cameras used to track the position of a robot or multiple robots at any given time. This tracking system is not connected at all to the robots. This tracking system is connected to a computer just to record all this information and we can analyze it later. Again, since this is a since swarm robotics are decentralized, the tracking system shouldn't inform the robots about their position unless that it's necessary because of the robots that they don't have the north enough sensors. But yeah. Tracking systems are useful because it helps us to measure how different or how similar, but most likely different, are our experiments compared to our simulations. And this difference is what people in research call it reality gap. The reality gap means that if you run a simulation of your robot, when you run it in physical, you might not have the same performance. You might not exhibit the same behaviors. And this is because in the simulator, you're making a lot of assumptions about the real world. I will talk more about it later on in a different lecture, but for example, some assumptions is that you can assume that the floor is flat when it's not. That the robots, they don't have noise when they do have. And it's important to measure this and to always keep it in mind. Statistics. If you want to publish a paper, you need to retrieve information about the performance of your robots and you need to have quantitative evidence about it. And the best way to do this is by using a tracking system to measure the performance and to retrieve all this data for you. And record data. Let's have, if you, you cannot look at the swarm at all times, that would be a waste of time. So you can use the tracking system to record all the data and to analyze it later. And if you detect something weirdly, you have this data to study what happened. Right, I'm going to mention some examples of tracking systems. The tracking systems that I'm going to mention, we have them all available here in the University of York, in the robot lab. And if you require a further tutorial about how to use them, please do let me know, send me an email about it, and we can arrange a discussion. But yeah, let's start. The OptiTrack. This is a very interesting one because it uses IR light to detect the position of the IR markers. The camera is the one on top, and the markers is the one on bottom. So when you send the light, this reflects on the marker, and the camera can detect this, this reflection. These cameras are very expensive, but also very accurate. Also, you can track robots in, in the three dimensions. But these cameras are using IR. And if your robots are using IR as well to avoid obstacles, or to communicate with each other, this is going to become a problem because the IR of the cameras is going to interfere with the readings of the robots. So if possible, you should try to avoid these tracking systems when you are working with IR sensors. Whereas a good example of good use of these robot, these tracking systems is with drones. They don't use IR. Well, most of them they don't. They use cameras. 
and you can track them in three, in three dimensions. The second one, Aruko tracking tags. This is a quite straightforward one. Basically, you have a camera on the ceiling pointing downwards, and you are using some image processing. In this case, you can use a library already made called OpenCV to do the tracking. The only problem is that it only works for two dimensions, which means that you can only use ground robots. And this is not very accurate. But again, accuracy depends on the task that you want to do. So probably you don't need that, that big accuracy and this will do. Yeah, yeah, this depends on your work. And the last one is IR, uh, RF tags. Basically, how this works is that you have tags, the ones on the bottom, the one that it says tag 3. And the beacon, the one on top, sends a signal and measures where the signal came from, where, where the tags are. So you can triangulate the position of the attack at any given time. This is how more or less GPS works, where you have a couple satellites and the satellites send a signal to your phone and by measuring with two or three satellites, they can estimate your position at any given time. The problem of this approach is that they're very susceptible, they're very sensible to Wi-Fi the precision is quite very low, it's the poorest of these three ones, it's around half a meter. But it works for aerial and ground robots, robots, and also you can use them in a larger space. You are not limited of where to put the camera. Right, let's recap. In the first part of the talk, we mentioned about what features and why is it important and what characteristics we want from our robot hardware. We had a brief discussion about robot standardization. Then we saw some examples of hardware or robot hardware available in different research groups across the world, including ours. And finally, we discuss about tracking systems. Why are they important? And what tracking systems are available here in York? So if you wanted to use them, they're available for you. In this blog post, you can find more information about some robotics and about standard standardization. Here's some articles that you can refer, and that's all. If you have any more questions, please do not hesitate and send me an email, and we can get in touch. Thanks.